good day to you all. I am Pastor Garrett, and I'm glad that you can all join me today as we continue to walk through the Gospel of Matthew together, which we will start in just a moment. Uh, but before we do, I want to just direct everyone who is a part of Kentwood Alliance Church. I want to just say to you, go check out the announcements that we've made regarding Good Friday service, uh, both on our Facebook page and also by email, so that you'll know what's happening for that. I uh, just want to make sure you're in the loop with everything that's going on there uh, with our Good Friday service. I also want to just say, Happy Palm Sunday, everyone. Uh, this is, of course the start of our Easter season. And it's kind of crazy that Easter is upon us and the churches can't even meet. I mean, this is, this is hundreds of years. Hundred years, we haven't seen anything like this. Um, it's kind of sad in some sense, uh, but at the same time, I'm looking forward uh, to when we can be together. Uh, Palm Sunday, it is today. And uh, today we recognize that moment in history when Jesus came to Jerusalem on his journey toward the cross to die on that cross for our sins, and he came riding on a donkey. And that was a fulfillment of the prophecy mentioned in Zechariah 9.9. And in there, we read those beautiful and exciting words, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Sing or shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And of course, we read that when Jesus came, the people waved palm branches and cried out, Hosanna, which means save us or even Savior. And so we rejoice today as Christians that our King has come and is indeed, has indeed saved the weary sinner by going to the cross in our place. So rejoice greatly, brothers and sisters. Jesus has come. I look forward to the coming week as well, where we can turn our eyes even further into the truths of the Easter season and the truths of the gospel. If you wouldn't mind, let's pray together before we jump into God's word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for uh, this Palm Sunday. I want to thank you for everything that uh, you have done on behalf of a sinful uh, world. Lord, thank you that you came, that you willingly went to the cross. Thank you for being our King and our Savior. Thank you for being all that we need in times like this, in the times we're in right now. Thank you, Lord, for being our Lord and Savior. Lord, I want to continue to pray for those who are on the front lines working at the hospitals and in the medical community. Uh, Lord, those of, who are in our own congregation who are doing that, continue to protect them, Lord. Keep them safe from this virus, Lord. I pray that you would bring about a swift end to this virus. But at the same time, we pray your will be done, Lord. Whatever you want to do at this time, however you want to move your church to know you better, uh, however you want us to long for one another's presence once again as we worship you together in person. Lord, whatever you want to do in this time, we give, we give that to you, Lord. Pray for our politicians, our leaders, that you would give them wisdom. And Lord, we just uh, lift all of this up to you. Be with us now, Lord, as we look into your word. May you be glorified. May we hear from you through your word. And may we um, know you more and may your Holy Spirit use it um, because your word is alive and active. And for these things, we ask for your understanding and your illumination. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, if you have your Bibles, uh, I want to ask you to uh, turn to our passage today, which is Matthew chapter 16, 23 through 28. And thankfully, it fits well into our Palm Sunday thoughts. And so we have no need to kind of look elsewhere for our message today. So let's, let's read it together. Matthew 16, 24 to 28. This is what Jesus says. He says, Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For, who, for whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will rep repay each person according to what he has done. 
Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. If you'll remember, uh, last Sunday we looked at that moment where Peter rebukes Jesus in Matthew 16, uh, 21 to 23. And Peter rebukes Jesus because Jesus said he was going to have to come to Jerusalem, suffer at the hands of the elders, and die. And this was absolutely unacceptable to Peter. This was not the course he figured that God should be taking. Peter figured this was no destiny for the king of heaven. So Jesus did not take kindly to Peter's comments, rebuking Peter as he did Satan himself. But the point of that passage was that Peter wanted to follow his own path and plan and not God's. And so Peter really was self-seeking in many ways. Peter had his own idea of what it meant to follow Jesus and what it meant to be a disciple of Jesus. He figured he ought to be living on the high hog if he was going to be a follower of Jesus the King. And so it's here that Jesus turns from Peter to the rest of the disciples and he sets the record straight on what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. And that is a call needed today as ever before. We need to know what it means to be a disciple. Okay, we need to know what that means. James Boyce, he put it this way. He says, there is a defect, even a fatal defect, in the life of the Church of Christ in the 20th century. And I'll add 21st century as well. He says it's a lack of true discipleship. For the genuine Christian, discipleship means forsaking everything to follow Christ. But for many of today's supposed Christians, perhaps the majority, it is the case that while there's much talk about Christ and even much furious activity that is supposed to be done in his name, there's actually very little following of Christ himself. And that means that in some circles, at least there's very little genuine Christianity. Many who fervently call him Lord, Lord are not Christians. Those are bold words from James Boyce, but he's got a point. There's a difference between being busy as a church and waking up each day and seeking the face of God to say, I want to follow you, Jesus, wherever you'll have me today. We very much like the teaching of blessings and prosperity and victory, but we're very, very much, we do not, sorry, we very much do not like the call to suffering, the call to death the call to pick up a cross. But without them, there is actually very little genuine Christianity to be had. And so Jesus says these words in our passage, verse 24, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. So first look at these words here. If anyone would come after me, this is the call to discipleship. If anyone listening today declares themselves to be a follower of Jesus, if anyone has said that they are a disciple of Christ, then this is what it has to look like. This is what it must look like. This is what a genuine disciple must be ready to do. And so it's an invite to imitate Jesus in his way that if we are to follow Jesus, then we are to imitate him and be prepared to run the same race as him. When Jesus came to Jerusalem riding on that donkey, he came to deny himself, to take up his cross, and to follow his Father, and to do his will, even unto death itself. And so Jesus is asking us to do the same. This is what it looks like. Be like Jesus. And that, my friends, is what he calls his disciples to. In direct contrast to Peter's vision of, of the future, Jesus says, no, if you're going to be my disciples, you're going to have to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. It's not easy. It's difficult. But what, what does it mean? So let's, let's look at that so we know. What does this all mean, okay? First, I want you to consider what it means to deny yourself. Again, if I, I drew so much insight here from James Boyce. I, I just loved what he had to say through this. 
when we talk about denying ourselves, we are at once brought to this radical distinction between a God-oriented life and a life of unrepentant self-seeking. Okay? A God-oriented life and a life of unrepentant self-seeking. We're in a place where we have to decide to live for Jesus and what he wants rather than what we want. Okay? Instead of seeking our own uh, intelligence, our own wisdom, our own desires, we're to take on the desires and directions of God and to do that. We're not to be self-seeking, but rather to be God-seeking. Okay? We're seeking God and His will each day. Self-seeking is really at the very beginning of all sin in this entire universe. Okay? Let me explain. In the beginning was self-seeking. Satan, in the beginning, was a self-seeker. He comes and he says, I'm going to displace God. I'm going to rule this universe. In Isaiah 14, uh, 12 to 15, we read Satan saying, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. And then later he says, I will make myself like the most high. This is more than a power grab. It's a statement that says, I want to do it my way, and not be under the authority of God any longer. It's self-seeking. And there's so many people, you know, there's hard decisions in life, or there's people that decide, you know, I'm going to do things the way I want to do things, and they don't truly bow the knee to Christ. And they claim to be Christians, but they won't bow the knee to what Christ has commanded them. And even when a brother or a sister or a pastor or someone who loves them comes and shows them here in Scripture, this is what it says, this is what God is asking of us. No. They won't change. That's not denying yourself. Christians are called to find our very life and breath in God. To not despise as authority, but welcome it as a son who adores his father. We're to eagerly seek his face and gladly do what he asks. We're to gladly surrender our lives to him. And why? Because he is good, holy, almighty father God. We love him. And our hearts have been changed where our affections are supposed to be like his affections. The things that he loves, we are slowly being changed to love as well. That is what it's supposed to look like. Obedience because we want to. Obedience because we delight in him and his truth. And so Satan was self-seeking. And what did that get him? It brought him low. Okay? It, it, it destroyed him. He was cast down out of heaven. And his end will be eternal judgment in hell. So he brought himself up only to be cast down by God. And that's how things work. Uh, notice, Jesus did the exact opposite. Jesus brought himself low. He got off his throne. He came down to us. He denied himself. He de de denied his divine rights. He willfully suffered, willfully took up his cross. He willfully died on that cross. And by abasing himself, he took those whom he loved and he lifted them from sin to glory. He washes the feet of his disciples to show that servanthood is how he's leading. And by bringing himself low, God exalted him and lifted him up. He gave him the name above every other name that every tongue will confess Jesus as Lord to the glory of the Father, says Philippians 2.11. So Jesus, he denied himself. He humbled himself under the Father's plan. He sacrificed and he gave up what was his. So he denied himself. That is what God calls us to do. If we are to come after Jesus and learn from him, and him really truly being our teacher, if we are to be his disciples, then we must deny ourselves, not be self-seeking, but to have a God-oriented life. So I encourage you in our first point here, assess your life and decide, is your life God-oriented? Whose direction and commands and plan are you following? Yours or God's? Deny yourself if you hope to follow Jesus as a disciple. We have to deny ourselves and ask, what is it that God wants me to do? Next, we're told that if we we're to come after Jesus as disciples, then we must pick up our cross. You know, Peter just earlier despised the idea of the cross. And so Jesus hammers it home here to correct him. You can't be my disciple unless you pick up your cross. 
Now what does that mean? It means this. Not only are we to say no to ourselves, deny ourselves, but we're also to say yes to God. This is what taking up your cross involves. This does not mean that you're going to have to merely suffer. To take up your cross is to involve the will. Jesus went to the cross because the Father asked him to. He willingly went. The cross was not a mere coincidence of Christ's life. It was the plan of Christ's life. In the same way, the cross is not simply a call to endure the coincidental moments of suffering as a Christian. It is a call to go and pick it up. To say yes to what God has called you to do, even if it's a hard thing. To say yes to God. Deny yourself and say yes to God. That, that's what it means. It means saying yes to something difficult for Jesus' sake. And indeed, to follow God in this world is difficult. It is to willingly bear a cross. Matthew 25 says that the cross bearing involves things like feeding the hungry and the thirsty, receiving the stranger, clothing the naked and visiting the prisoner. It also means we do the hard thing of being a witness to our neighbor to uphold the truth in a world that is really hostile to the truth. It is the denial of comforts and ease, the denial of making money our God and, and time and convenience. So the cross is a heavy burden, and so it is the responsibility that we have in this world. And it was no less for Jesus. Jesus said yes to his father when he asked him to go to the cross. The wood and the sliver and the rough surface of that cross on his back, he had to carry it, and so do we. Will you say yes to God as well? When God prompts you from his word, will you say yes? When God asks you to do the hard thing, will you say yes? Will you say yes to God? Don't ignore him. <laughs> say yes. Romans 12, 1 says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. A living sacrifice. Again, this is a hard word from Jesus. We want, we want the Jesus who fills us and thrills us and blesses us and satisfies us and strengthens us. But not often do we want the one who calls us to take up our cross. So if anyone would come after Jesus, they must not only deny themselves, but they must also say yes to God. Say no to yourself and say yes to God. Yes at the expense of even your own life. You know, a cross is not merely something to carry. It's something you carry to death. It's something you carry to death. You're dying to self. This brings us to the next point. Jesus says, that if anyone is to come after me, he must follow me. And he must follow me even to the point of death. Deny himself, take up his cross, and then he says, follow me. In verse 25, he goes on to say, we must be willing to lose our lives for his sake. So Jesus is, is not just a door to enter, but he's a path to follow right to the very end of our lives. So we cannot just make our self-denial and our cross-carrying kind of a one-time thing. It's a daily thing. It's a constant thing. We never stop following. So to follow is to really walk in the footsteps of Jesus, to go where he goes and to be where he is, to love what he loves and to do what he does. And by this, we proclaim that we are ambassadors of Christ and we come and we are his hands and we are his feet in a world that so needs Jesus. So we follow also by reading his word reading scripture and to actually do what it says, to put it into practice. We follow by prayer and not only just the act of praying like Jesus prayed, but also praying for the things that God wills. You know, following is also about going where Jesus goes, even if it's really hard, even if it's really hard. There's a, a book called The Boy Who Followed His Father Into Auschwitz. It's a true story about a 17-year-old Jewish boy who, sent, uh, who was sent to the Nazi concentration camp called Buchenwald. I think I said that right. 
um, and his father was with him. His father is 53 years old. And they worked hard each day because they, they were together and they wanted to stay together and they wanted to survive. If you were weak, you would be put to death usually, so they worked hard together. Well, one day they're told that the father is going to be transferred to Auschwitz and the son was going to have to be left behind. And you know, everybody knew what that meant. If you're getting transferred to Auschwitz, it's a death sentence. The gas chambers at Auschwitz were efficient. And the boy was distraught by this news, and the son, he went to the capo, or the capo, who is kind of another prisoner, who was meant to supervise the other prisoners and kind of organize them. And so he went to, the, he went to him, and, and this, this capo said to him, he said, if you want to live, you better forget about your father. And the son said, no, I can't forget about my father. He says, do whatever you have to, pull whatever strings you've got to pull. I don't want to live if I cannot be with my father. I don't want to live if I cannot be with my father. And the boy was transferred. He got what he asked for. The boy was transferred with his father. He followed his father to the place of Auschwitz. He followed his father to the place of death, let's call it. And they ended up living there for a long time and they ended up being freed and liberated from that place avoiding the gas chambers in the end but i just feel like it's such an amazing story this boy who followed his father into auschwitz i mean can we be like this boy where we say i will follow jesus no matter where he leads me i don't want to live if not with him that's what it looks like to follow Jesus to the point of death. I don't want to live if not with him. I don't want to wake up and have another day if I'm not walking in the place and area and in the direction that Jesus wants me to go. I want to follow wherever he is taking me, wherever he is going. Because if not, I'd rather die. If we're to come after Jesus, we must deny ourselves, pick up our cross, and follow. That is what a disciple is. Fortunately, God does not leave us with this heavy burden without encouragement. Jesus says, whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. You are simply giving up this temporal life for an eternal one. That's beautiful. Which leads us to the next verse, verse 26. This is a quite high price to pay to be a true disciple, isn't it? I mean... The question is simply this, is it all worth it? Is it worth it? Is all of what we have been talking about so far, this, uh, is it a good investment? Well, I guess it comes down to this. Ask this question, what is the value of your eternal soul? What's the value of it to you? You know, verse 26 says, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or, what shall a man give in return for his soul? When you look at what this world has to offer, power, influence, popularity, wealth, possessions, comforts in excess, if Satan were to offer you all those things, you would feel that Satan's offer sounds pretty good. Jesus was offered all that by Satan to give up his mission when he was in the temptation in the desert. There is no reason why Satan cannot use the same temptations and schemes against you and I to give up on this Christian calling and just live a little, you know, live a little and live easier. No more of this trying to follow commands and rules and going to church every Sunday. I don't get to sleep in anymore. And ah, Satan can offer you a cheap, paltry, and temporary imitation of heaven, but never true heaven. Boy says, those who worship Satan for what the world offers will perish with him in the end. Is it really worth gaining the whole world and having everything you ever wanted temporarily in this life if it means giving up your soul for eternity? Would you really sell your soul for a crumb of bread? Would you really give up eternity in heaven with God for influence and power or possession? You know, people all over the world, they're selling their souls for all sorts of things that are just not going to last. 
things they cannot keep for a fleeting bit of pleasure. Heaven and earth will pass away, the Bible says. Your soul is going to remain. It is foolish to take what is temporary and throw away your eternal soul. So Jesus says, your soul is worth more than anything in the entire world. The whole world and all its glory and riches and power is not even close to the value of your soul. You know, when judgment comes and we stand before the throne, there is nothing that we gained on earth that we can use to buy back our soul from hell. Not even your reputation, not even your supposed good works. My friends, this world offers much to us. After all, God created it, all its beauty and goodness. It's all of God. It's really a broken reflection of what heaven is going to be. But please, Live in such a way that your value is placed on your soul and not on the things of this world. Okay, Live in such a way that your value is placed on your soul and not on the things of this world. If you are going to build treasures, may they be treasures in heaven. If you're going to please someone, may it be God, your Father, not your flesh, that you want to please. Is your soul worth all that sacrifice and effort? The answer here is yes. It is worth it. It is worth all that to spend an eternity with God in paradise, to walk with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, to look upon the face of your Lord in the new heaven and the new earth and where there will be no more sin, no more sorrow, no more suffering, and to be told, well done, good and faithful servant. To worship Him for eternity will just be this glorious, sweet time. I think about the sweetest times of worship that we have here on earth. It's not going to compare to what we get to do in heaven forever. The places we get to go, the things we get to explore, the paradise that will be heaven. I think about the feast we get to have with our Savior when all this is said and done, when we get to sit at the table with our Lord and Savior and have a feast with Him. It's going to be a beautiful time. Is it worth it? Yes, it's worth it. <laughs> and we will experience it together. Verse 27 to 28 finishes by saying this, For the Son of Man is coming back. It says, For the Son of Man is going to come with His angels in the glory of His Father, and then he'll repay each person according to what he has done. And truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And so this serves, you know, as both an encouragement and a warning. Jesus will return one day in the glory of his Father, and he's going to repay persons according to what they have done. And uh, it's an encouragement because we live uh, for Christ. As we live for Christ, we are going to be noticed and rewarded. And it's a warning because for those who are not in Christ, who live for selfishness and for sinfulness, it will be punished. And just to clarify, this last verse, Jesus says to the disciples, Come, or sorry, some of you standing here will not taste death until you see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now, some of you here are worried when you read this, you think, well, there's a flaw in Scripture. Jesus has not come back yet. And he said he's going to come back. And he says, some of you standing here will not taste death till you see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And you're thinking, well, Jesus has not come back yet and the disciples are all dead. So how can this statement by Jesus be true? There's many interpretations that have been put forth. But the one that I think is best, and it fits here, is that Jesus is not talking about the end times return with this statement. He was talking about what is coming up next in Matthew, which is the transfiguration of Jesus. Okay, it's, all, it's in the other Gospels as well. They all put this statement right next to the transfiguration. This moment where Christ's deity, this is what the transfiguration is, the moment where Christ's deity and glory shines out from Jesus and the few disciples who are there see Jesus in heavenly glory. And according to MacArthur, the phrase in verse 28, the kingdom, can also be translated royal splendor, which certainly matches this idea of Jesus here talking about the transfiguration. In other words, some of you will not taste death before you see the Son of Man in his royal splendor. And why is that important? Because as they sacrifice, and as they... Uh, anticipate 
the carrying of the cross. And as they look forward to the rewards of God for their life lived as disciples, Jesus, by the transfiguration experience, is going to rouse them to the future glory of the kingdom and remind them that it's worth it. It's all worth it. That Jesus is worth it. So the glory of God and his kingdom is truly magnificent. It's worth living for. It's worth dying for. It's worth carrying your cross for. It's worth uh, giving up your life for, denying yourself. How much more magnificent is the one from whom the glory shines? We live for him now as we look forward to that day to come. So as we kind of come to the end of this, I want to just quote Boyce one last time. He says, we live in a day when a substantial part of the evangelical world wants a domesticated Jesus who blesses and satisfies, fills, thrills, and strengthens his flowers, but does not insist on a cross. But what we need is the genuine Jesus who demands that his followers die to self and actually follow him. We need that Jesus, folks, because we need those kind of disciples. That's what is needed in this fallen world. Those kinds of disciples who are going to deny themselves. Boyce continues, we know what Jesus demands of us or we would not be Christians. We know that we need to take up the cross and follow Jesus, but have we taken it up and are we bearing it daily? We know the value of the soul, but do we live as if we believe it? We know the value of the soul. We have, a, we have heard of Christ's return, but do we look forward to it joyfully? Those who are blessed by God will answer, yes, 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 to those questions. Are you ready to die? Are you ready to die, to, die, to deny yourself, to pick up your cross, to follow Jesus, to say no to me, yes to God, and to follow? Are you ready to die? May you lift your cross high and follow Jesus today. Let's pray. God, what you ask of us is difficult, and it took the Lord of heaven and earth to show us the example. Lord God, would you give us the wisdom, the strength, the will to be able to fulfill what this is saying to us? Would you give us all that we need in order to be this kind of disciple? Would you, Holy Spirit, shine into our life and show us where we fall short and where we need to make a change? I thank you, Jesus, for your example how you denied yourself, how you stepped off your throne, how you denied all of this divine authority and all the divine um, glory that you enjoyed for so long. You stepped off your throne. You came here. You humbled yourself. You went to the cross. You carried your cross for us. You followed your Father's commands and you died. But praise be to you, Lord Jesus. You rose on, on the third day, defeating sin and death. And now we follow you as our risen Savior. So thank you, Lord, for coming on that donkey. Thank you for riding into Jerusalem. Thank you for being the one who saves. Without you, we'd be in darkness. We thank you for all these things, Lord Jesus. We pray that you would... Uh, bless our church body and the people that are in it. Look after us, Lord. Continue to look after us. Help us to deny ourselves and pick up our crosses even now in this time, Lord, as we are, um, as we are looking to our neighbors and to those around us and trying to figure out how we can love one another in this time. So, Lord, thank you for this. Cause us and move us, sanctify us to be disciples for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a blessed Sunday, everybody. Thanks for watching and uh, hope you're blessed today. Uh, have a good have a good day. <laughs>